Greetings, Church. It's uh, Kevin DeClaren once again, and um, I wanted to take a few minutes of your time. It is uh, right now 3.55 p.m., and I am in uh, Salem, Oregon, and I just, uh, I believe, for the 10th time, tried to upload um, the document uh, of 128 pages that I had completed um, in August um, for the Library of Congress. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I, uh, um, well, actually at the beginning of the year, I had completed an application online and uh, sent in uh, a payment um, and also uploaded 14 uh, sermon videos. But um, I didn't have the booklet that um, that comes with the videos. It, basically, it's, it was supposed to be an outline of every sermon. I wasn't able to get an outline of every sermon because of all the tribulation and, and troubles and problems that I was having in that apartment complex um, under Cascade Management and Gretchen Kafora Commons. So I had to um, basically gather what information I had and compile it together and then just send it in. Um, the document was due on um, September 30th. I sent it in on August 27th. Um, as a matter of fact, I tried to upload it um, to the worker Karen Powell, but it didn't go through. So then I made a, a manual copy of it and I sent it up um, through West Salem um, Public Library, uh, not Public Library, but West Salem um, Post Office, uh, which is not too far from here. And I thought I had paid for uh, the stamps and everything, and I placed it in the box um, to be uh, delivered. And it should have arrived the following Saturday, which would have been um, sometime in September, probably around September 5th or 7th. Um, so I wrote the Library of Congress and I told them that they were, you know the, the book was on its way um, and uh, tried to keep in contact with uh, the different specialists that were um, emailing me back and forth. And um, before uh, the month of August was over, they basically terminated the application. They rejected it. And Karen had sent me a letter. I, I talked about this in another video. Um, Karen has sent me a letter um, offering me two options. Uh, the first option was to register the work as unpublished. And the other option was to take one video um, with the book and publish it as published. Because the work um, being published at separate times during the course of 2016 and 2017 um, was not qualified to be considered one work. And so I can't, I wasn't able to compile the work like I normally do. Um, take the 14 videos, put them together in one DVD, which is what I normally do, and submit it in with a book. I wasn't able to do that this time. And so she explained uh, what the new procedure was as of 2014, which I wasn't aware of. And uh, she asked that I, um, I publish it as, you know, in other words, a DVD has to be um, made available for the public with all 14 works and it's sort of like a music video um, or, um, or like a song uh, CD, you know, all 15 uh, songs are on there and you can go to the, your local store and pick up a copy of it um, rather than just p compiling it together and then submitting it for registration. I could do it that way. Anyway, long story short, a couple days ago I went online and uh, this is the receipt that I was given by the um, by the machine 
that I had used to purchase the postage. Okay, this is um, this is uh, West Salem, West Salem um, Station. You can see it there, and uh, this is what I had paid for. Um, when I put up, when I when I turn to the USPS tracking system, um, that's the number that. Okay, the USPS tracking system, that long number, right there where my finger is at, right there. Um, they basically told me that the package never left Salem. So here we are, The this was on the 18th when I checked this, this was yesterday. The package never left Salem. So I ended up calling, emailing the Library of Congress and letting them know that the package is still here in Salem. It never left. Um, I went to the post office and spoke to several of the workers there. I suspect that some were workers and others were representatives of the gay clan community. Um, it looks like some of them were well known in the music industry. I don't know their names, but these people were, were representing them. And there was another that was representing a member of uh, the Franklin family. D. Franklin and his son Joseph, sort of like a combination of the two men in one. Um, when the discussion was over, I had suggested that maybe we should call the police since they don't know where the package is and I don't know what has happened to it. Um, they basically declared that the package uh, never made it into the box. I never placed it there. I basically called them lying homosexuals um, as a result of it because they were double talking to me, they were talking to me this way, and they were also talking to me the other way. Um, I was pretty heated up and pretty upset at the fact that this is an ongoing thing um, with this community because they will not release me to live as a Christian. Um, and they're determined to have me walk in this um, continent and pretty much anywhere as a sodomite and they're not going to uh, release me back to the faith and they're not going, I feel like a captive and they have me living in the streets. I can only co collect social security disability for a thousand five dollars. I can't make any more money than that. Um, they're demanding for me to get a phone, but the problem is with the phone, when I get a phone, they take the phone, they make calls, long distance calls. They, um, they stole in the last phone that I had purchased for $250 from Sprint. Um, so they're making it more difficult than it needs to be. Um, I walked out of there yesterday feeling discouraged at the fact that this is what the, uh, this is what the postal service is doing. I had also another package that I had just sent to the Library of Congress and this one was for 570 uh, 581 pages and this is the case against Cascade Management. When I checked up on it um, this morning it looks like it has already arrived um, in Washington DC. So it's there but it wasn't delivered yet. So I'm not exactly sure um, how come that one arrived but the one um, basically for First Peter has not yet arrived and I'm not sure what the delay is. I was told that it was um, it was being delivered through grounds, um, so it, it's passed on from. It, it's it's. I don't even know if it'll be there in November. Um, so I don't know if the if it's lost, the package is lost, or if it is just a deliberate hit. I basically walked out of there, and I made them understand that that was a deliberate hit. That was insulting against me as a Christian. That was insulting against me exercising my freedom of religion, this is ridiculous. So, you know, um, I hope to God that these people are not doing that to you who are ministers in the church um, because that's a really strong stance for for the postal service to, to take, you know, to take somebody else's property and to give it to someone. And I know that in the past it has happened where I've sent book manuscripts to the library um, into the copyright office and for them not to deliver it. And then I have to make an extra copy to um, uh, to basically send it, to send it back in there. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, the work is incomplete, you know? It's sporadic. 
I mean, out of the 14, I think nine of them, I had the entire outline and the rest of it was pretty much, there wasn't much there. But even, even so, um, the work should, it's 128 pages of work. It should have been done. It should have been done. So yesterday I walked out of there feeling about this big, you know, that they uh, took the manuscript and I don't know where it went. In the evening, um, they had a young man, because um, I, I showed you where I, I, I parked the, the tent. Um, in the evening, they had a young man. I don't know who he was. He reminded me of the manager that had helped me the last time I was there. Um, he had a package in his hands and I wasn't sure how to interpret what they were saying, uh, except for the fact that they have the package and I don't know if they're going to deliver it or not or what they're doing with it. Um, it's my only copy of, I haven't, I had an extra copy. I don't know if they took it out of the storage. I'm not exactly sure where it is. Um, but before printing another copy and sending it, um, I thought, well, I better contact the library all day long today. Um, I went to, you know, I've been going from place to place, coffee house after coffee house, trying to upload this video to, to the, to the uh, copyright office. And pretty much everywhere I've gone, I've even gone to the, um, library next door, which is the Capitol library, the federal government library. And whoever's in the back, um, controlling the internet, um, would not allow me to send it. <laughs> so I, I thought perhaps I could, uh, go to a church, um, and do it there. But, um, the pastors were in a meeting There's a Presbyterian church directly behind, um, this building here. Right now I'm at Ike, uh, this, it's a coffee house directly across the street from, um, directly across the street from, um, from the Presbyterian church in, in the area. Um, I went, I went in there to, to see if I can talk to one of the pastors and maybe they could explain to me why the post office would do something like that or why the federal government would not allow, um, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the manuscript to, to be uploaded before leaving the government, uh, library office or library building, they basically, what they said was white men only. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure if they're talking about Englishmen, British men, European men, or Klansmen. Um, I just, I just shrugged and walked away. I didn't, I didn't know what they were saying. I didn't argue with them. You know, this is their city. This is their state. And Melinda, um, basically says, you need to go talk to the church. You need to know their side of the story. And when I knocked on the door, when I rang the bell, um, the woman that answered it was a Catherine Magdalena and, um, not the real woman, but a duplicate woman. And so that means somehow or another, they got my mother involved. Okay. And, uh, she was like, well, I don't know what to tell you because the pastors are not available. They're in a meeting. And so I said, okay, I was standing there for about a minute or so. And she went to get someone and the Lord came on. And when he did, because I told you that I've been speaking to him for weeks and months now. And when he came on out in the spirit, I was like, okay. And what he communicated to me is what you see on the board behind my head. And all he said was go, just leave. So uh, she had told me to sit down twice, but the spirit of the Lord was saying, no, you need to leave. You need to go. Um, and the woman, um, I don't know who she was. I don't know if she was a volunteer. I think she might've been a volunteer. Um, and so I, I didn't speak to her again. So I just turned around and left. Um, and I came into this place and, um, this, this place here. And, um, I didn't buy coffee or anything, but this is what I purchased. You know, I bought some cheese and, and an egg and, uh, and thought, okay, well, I can't send it to D Denise Garrett, um, uh, or Karen Powell or, um, Rose Matthews because I had their direct um, email to reply because I've been talking to those people for the last three or four months. And so I, I went to the contact uh, page and I was able to upload it and send it. So, you know, cross my fingers, I'm hoping that this text is finally in there. You know, um, I don't know what they do with it. I hope it, uh, gets registered like it was supposed to back in August as an unpublished work um, because I can't produce uh, a DVD 
or a CD and put both the, the sermons on there and 128 page book um, unedited uh, just to give it away because what are they going to do with it right who am I going to give it to or make it available so I had to take the hit and have it registered as unpublished so now I'm waiting for the response from the Library of Congress for them to say we received your um, we received your document that's pretty much all I want to hear is that they received the document and hopefully it will get into the right hands um, as far as the common the what you see back there you know the beginning um, from the very beginning I think what the Lord was communicating is that from the very beginning man has sinned against him uh, get, you know man has been sinning against God and that's basically what the problem is um, and from the beginning until 2017 this is this is the accusation against man by God what you see right there is what he wrote in the spirit against humanity that from the beginning the issue has been sin um, against God through 2017 the issue continues to be sin against God from Genesis to Revelation um, it wasn't me who said it it was him who said it and that's been the issue so the issue with the um, with the manuscript sin against God the issue with the uh, inability uh, to upload the videos uh, sin against God the uh, issue of homosexuality which is a hot uh, little topic in all of the world and in my life today sin against God um, every pastor um, every leader what messes up their churches sin against God what messes up their marriages sin against God what messes up their board uh, of elders sin against God it's that same old um, that same old sin that has been um, and, and you can call it whatever you want but that sin that rebellion um, I think Romans 1 talks about uh, the sin he says that even though they knew God they wouldn't honor him as God but they became futile in their speculation and their foolish heart was darkened and professing to be wise they became fools they suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and so God turned them over it's that same sin where they say there is no God it's that same sin where they say there is no Lord it's that same sin where uh, man thinks he's he's capable of ruling um, the heavens and the earth by himself without subjecting himself to to the Creator um, living in a world where you know there's no God so I could do whatever I want and um, I don't have to acknowledge him I don't have to yield to him I don't have to submit to him and that means on a daily basis I could just forget him just by suppressing the truth and making the things of this world um, more important you know um, the church planting um, what's holding it back it's sin against God sin in the hearts of Christians um, sin in the hearts my sins um, and that that's you know why is it taking 20 years for a church to be planted because of sin that's all you, it doesn't have you don't have to you know the details of the sin it's just sin against God just re outright rebellion of us not wanting to yield to um, to his scriptures I went to um, Salem Evangelical earlier today and picked up some food um, I was grateful that they allowed me to get some food um, I got some food and um, on my way to their office to see whether or not they had a library where they had Wi-Fi um, across the street from them they had a, uh, this, this house and um, I looked into it and it looked like it was abandoned um, when I spoke to them about it they're like oh no this house has been condemned you know it, it sits on feasties <laughs> and I thought oh and uh, I was trying to get the secretary and the pastor to um, rent it to me so that I wouldn't have to spend um, the winter out in the cold in a tent because last night the Lord pretty much ripped the tent um, not ripped it apart but the wind kept on blowing and it blew so hard that it took out one of the awnings and I had to go out there and to tie it back up again so it gets chilly in that tent um, 
As far as work is concerned, secular work is concerned, I filled out this application for two hours yesterday, only to to not be able to make it to um, to the to the um, to the interview that they wanted to give me this morning at 9:30, and so. You know the, the bus system and the train system just wouldn't have gotten me there on time so i had to basically cancel it out and their uh, their offices are up in portland so i'd have to make a special trip up there this coming week and this coming week in order to deal with the company and see perhaps um you know stay overnight and get the interview uh then uh, take a risk and see what happens um I think I had mentioned in the last video that I was working on um, on the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, which I've outlined, and now I'm working on Titus. Uh, it's just a basic outline. It's nothing um, major. You know, when you go to seminary, um, you expect to retain a lot of the work, but sometimes you you forget a lot of the work, and um, and in, and in doing so. Um, you know, you got to give the church the simple, the simplest uh, outline that you can of the text. And from what I can see, Paul warns Timothy uh, of a lot of um, the things that are coming. You know, I think there's one, there's one scripture that stands out, if you don't mind me reading it. Um, there's a scripture that stands out in my mind, and I want to read it to you. I think it's, it's, it's in, um, this is the church that gave me the food. Um, I think his name is Randy Butler. Yeah, I don't know him very well. But he prayed for me, so I thank God for his prayer. But here, Paul says this to, um, Paul says this in um, in 2 Timothy. He says, uh, he says in 2 Timothy, he says, you must understand this, that in the last days, that, that is uh, 2 Timothy 3, Okay, so you must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, uh, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman. Um, he says implacable, slanderers, pro uh, profligates, I've never heard that word before, brutes, haters of good, treacherous. I usually use the New American Standard Bible. This is the... Um, this is the uh, New Revised Standard Version with the Apocrypha and the Deuterocanonical um, deutero canonical books. <laughs> okay, so this is my first time using this version, so you'll have to forgive me. I got it out of um, Salem Evangelical Church, which is where they have like this bookshelf full of Bibles and books, and this is the one that I ended up with. I was looking for a New American Standard Bible, but I couldn't find it. But Paul here writes Timothy, and he says in verse 4, they were treacherous, uh, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the uh, outward form of godliness, but denying its power. So all of this man is doing, um, it's all outward. He says, um, holding to a form, to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power, avoid them. For among them are those who make their way into household and captive, uh, captivate silly women overwhelmed by their sins and swayed by all kinds of desires who are always being instructed and can never arrive at a knowledge of the truth, as Janus and Jumbers suppose Moses. So these people of corrupt mind um, and counterfeit faith also oppose the truth, but they will not make much progress because as in the case of those two men, their folly will become plain to everyone. But the point that the issue that I'm addressing is what Paul says here in verse 1. He says, you must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come. We're 2,000 years later, it, more than that. And we've been telling the church that in the last days, this, uh, this is the last days. And um, we are in that last days. The Lord doesn't say how long the last days last. The scripture says that um, a thousand years for the Lord, a thousand years for man is a, a day for the Lord. So two days, two thousand years, three days, three thousand years. That's that's what the time frame is like. Um, 
for us it's thousands, but for him it's only one. And um, so for the last two two days or so, um, you know, the, in the last days, distressing times will come. And Paul says it several times in um, in the text that um, evil is coming and uh, wickedness is coming and uh, man is going to continue to um, and he says it through uh, and he says it several other times in the text that um, so we're to expect this you know um, we're not and this is what we forget on a day-to-day -day basis in the country and in the church is that um, when these difficult times come we don't know what they look like you know, as individual Christians or as church um, congregations, right? Because we're so focused on whatever we're focused on. And nine times out of ten, it's not God. We've got a gazillion other things that are roaming through our heads. We often forget um, the Bible is how, is one of the ways that God speaks to, to us apart from creation and His Holy Spirit and His angels uh, and dreams and visions uh, God never stops speaking to us. Um, he has never stopped communicating to us. Right now in, in, in Salem, it's pouring rain. It's cold and it's windy. Um, and I'm thinking, how do I deal with uh, pouring rain, cold, wind, living in a tent? And part of me don't want to be a Paul and living in a tent because that was his profession, but that is now my life. Um, for the last several uh, months, I've been living in a tent and doing ministry in a tent. You know, I go in there at night with my little flashlight and I'm uh, reading scripture and I'm praying and I'm worshiping. Or I wake up in the morning and I am preaching. Uh, this morning I woke up and I had to give, um, you know, this, this, ser this sermon that I really didn't want to give because I had to address issues and sometimes I go off the cuff. And that means I go off the text. I'll make uh, references to the text, but then I have to literally uh, speak in a secular voice in order for them to understand the nature of the offense. Um, that means uh, me sometimes having to say things that I don't really want to say, um, me having to uh, address issues that I really don't want to deal with, um, me talking to uh, Gabriel or John MacArthur in a tone that is disrespectful when I really don't want to, but sometimes the flesh gets to you because you get so tired of repeating the issues and you get so tired of dealing with it um, to the point where the unbelievers are looking at you like you're a devil. You know, you yourself are the devil. You yourself are an unbeliever and you don't really believe the text, but the problem um, is is what I think the Lord has said here in the board, is that from the beginning until now, the issue, what stands in between us and God is sin. So, you know, Paul says, difficult times will come. I'm right in the middle of it. Um, I think another passage is in Romans chapter two, where um, Paul says, therefore you, you have no excuse, um, whoever you are, when, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. So the government that is judging me and calling me out as a, as a queer, as a homosexual, as a fag, or as that, like I've made mention before, uh, because there are complications and there are accusations that that's how I'm living. I mean, I don't exactly have a partner, um, only on certain days when they want me to go there to redeem their side that, you know, I, I have to go and do all of that. But as far as my convictions and how I live on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I would have gone in this direction, right? And, and gotten married, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. But I wanted to read you this passage because it says here in Romans 2, he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. Um, I'm under the judgment. Of, of man. I'm under the judgment of churches. I'm under the judgment of communities. I walk into the church instantly. It's either um, the, the, the world community comes in, takes the position of those who are in uh, the church. They take the position of the pastor. They take the position of the secretaries uh, and they switch. I'm not exactly sure why, but they've been doing it for years. And so that's, that's a form of judgment when you're dealing with the community rather than you're dealing with your brothers and sisters in Christ, people who have faith. So Paul here, and I'm bringing this issue up because it says here, therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, 
So Paul is saying, whoever you are, I mean, that means that applies to us in this generation. He says, when you judge others, as a Christian, I'm under judgment every day. Every day, sometimes I wake up and I'm going, God, what am I going to eat? And the little bit of money that I have saved up is, is, is for housing or perhaps a car in the future or, you know, to pay a bill, to travel, to leave, you know, in case I need to flee because the clan comes out or something comes out. But is the scriptures here it says when you judge others for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you the judge right he's talking to to those who judge he says you the judge whether it be government church state uh, the Franklins the MacArthur's the gay community strangers he says you the judge are doing the very same thing so whatever you, you people are, are are making the decision to judge me on and you're pointing the finger at me the scripture says you're, do, you're the very thing you're judging. This man of or somebody else of you yourself are guilty of that, right? You yourself are guilty of the same thing. I think that's pretty clear in the text here in verse one. It says, "When you judge others for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing." So, um, gay people who judge people for being gay are themselves gay, right? So, gays judge gays, clan judge clan, um, slaves judge slaves. That's basically what he's saying here. He says, "You say." We know that God's uh, judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth, making reference to Romans chapter one, where Paul goes through um, that list after uh, he says that they've been turned over um, three times. So here he continues and he says, you know, you people are not, you, you Romans are without excuse, both uh, Gentile and church. He says, uh, we know that God's, you who say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourselves, you will escape the judgment of God? So he brings it up another notch. He's saying, here you are passing judgment on this guy, and you think he's a coward, and he think you think he's a fag, and you think he's it, and you think he's that, yet the word says that you're passing judgment on yourself because you're just as guilty. You're doing it in the closet with somebody else, right? I mean, you're a closet fag, or you're a closet queen, or you're a closet clan, or you're a closet slave, or whatever it is that you're doing, you're, it is in the closet, yet he's saying, do you think that you're going to escape God's judgment because you're guilty of the same thing that you're judging somebody else of? He says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And I wake up in the morning and I tell the American people, this is what's missing out of you is repentance. What is missing out of you is repentance. If there is anything that God has not yet put in your heart as a people, it's repentance. Repentance that leads to reconciliation, reconciliation that leads to you being forgiven as sinners and so behind me here what do you see that from the beginning is the the, the, the the guilt on man is sin against god to 2017 what is still the, the problem sin against god why because there is no repentance right god's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance man does not know the kindness of god and in order for them to understand the kindness of god they have to understand the position of christ and Christ is the one who says, come to me on who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I will give you rest from carrying this burden of sin that's dragging you down. And man doesn't want it. They don't want it on any form. They think that if they turn to uh, the members of their race, who is, you know, white, black, Spanish, Asian, whatever, you know, we're going to go uh, with, with a pastor from our, from our race, or we're going to go with a, with a pastor who practices same sex, or we're going to go with somebody that, and, and God is saying, no, you don't understand. That's not the issue. The issue is, it, it is not same sex or same race or, you know, a, a white person leading you. The issue is your relationship with me. There is sin between us. That's what the issue has been since the beginning, is that there is sin between you and I. And the sin puts you against me as your creator. And you suppress the truth that I've been trying to tell you since the beginning. So here, 
Um, Paul writes to the church of Rome and he says, do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but by your hard and in, impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of judgment, on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will repay according to each one's deeds uh, to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. While for those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth, but wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. So the people at the post office, there's no partiality. The people at the federal government library, there's no partiality. The people in these apartment complexes, there's no partiality. The people that have me sleeping in the streets rather than in the home. This morning I woke up and I said, you know what? This isn't fair, Americans, because when you want to go to sleep, where do you sleep? You sleep where? In a bed. I'm sleeping on a tarp in a tent. Where do you live? You live where? In a home. When you eat, where do you eat? You don't eat on the floor. You eat sitting on the table behind you sit on a chair behind a table. When you bathe, you don't use, and this is really embarrassing, but you know, you, you don't. You know, I've got to carry this with me. You don't, you don't, you don't use, you know, plastic containers to urinate in and to carry water in um, so you can bathe. Right. I mean, when you, you go into a bathroom somewhere and in the bathroom is where you you cleanse yourself. Right. I mean, how long are you going to continue to diminish um, my my life? When are you going to give me back my life? And so the word of God here says God shows no partiality. Everything catches up. And so, you know, church, if you're in a situation, you pastors, you leaders, um, you that are for or against my life and my ministry, I want to remind you of, you know, first that, that passage in, in Timothy where Paul says to you, all of you pastors out there, difficult times are going to come. Okay. And when they come, remember the righteous judgment of God and that none of us are excluded because as we are pointing, as we're sitting around elder boards and we're talking high and we've got rings on our fingers and, you know, we want to, we, we want to talk about, you know, how happy we are in our marriages and we're raising our kids and we're pointing fingers at other brothers that are not on our level. Just keep in the back of your mind that what you're pointing your finger at in judging a, a brother that's in the, in the, in the church, but you put him in the world. Um, God is looking at you and going, well, your slate is not exactly clean with me. Why? Because from the very beginning, what's been the issue with man overall is sin. And, um, you know, Paul continues and says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, Isaiah even says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So I'm going to have to cut the, the out the, this, this little talk of ours short. Um, because I've been here for almost 40 minutes and I don't want to be here for a very long time, but I wanted to just give you that little jolt, whatever the state is doing, whatever uh, the community is doing, whatever members of your families are doing, uh, keep in back of your mind that difficult times are here. You know, there they remember Joe, difficult times came, but difficult times didn't stay. God gave it back. So at some point in the future, I'm sure God will give it back and, um, and I will have to deal with it again. But until then, uh, you know, keep me in your prayers and I will keep you in mind. Um, Father, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to the church. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to remind the church that Paul warned us in advance that difficult times will come. Even you, Lord, uh, warned us that um, you warned us, Lord God, that uh, men are going to hate you and persecute you. And um, because they hated you first. Um, and um, I pray this afternoon, Father, that you will heal the church um, and that you will give the church strength to stand. And uh, for those brothers that are kicked out of the church, not because they didn't believe in your gospel, not because they're at war with you, but because there are men in the congregation, women in the congregation, pushing them out the door. Um, 
and, and maybe you, Lord, may have an issue with them that might have a negative effect on the church and you put them outside so you can deal with that issue openly before, before the nation. And I pray for those brothers and I pray for those sisters, Lord, who will need to have ample amount of faith because faith, like I think the author of Hebrew says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. And by faith, there's a whole list of um, believers who acted on faith and trusted in you by faith. And I pray that even at this hour, you would strengthen my faith. I think even the apostles ask that you would increase their faith. So I would ask that you would increase my faith because I don't understand these last days. I don't understand these difficult times. I don't understand these uh, positions of judgment against me everywhere I go um, I don't understand I, I don't have anywhere to run to I don't have another state another city and I'm a county another community uh, another home I'm living from storage to storage and that's not the Christian way so I'm praying Lord God that you would be with me and you'd be with others that are um, working through the same issues uh, or maybe have worked through the same issues and have come to the wrong conclusion I pray, Lord God, that you will help those people. You will strengthen them. You will help the young as they deal with these issues. And some of them have not even tackled some of these issues. I pray for the women, pastors, wives, and secretaries, and women in the church that are single and widowed, um, who are dealing with the men on, on the homosexuality issue and on the fornication issue and on submitting to the community. Um, and there's a lot of judgment and backbiting, and there's a lot of finger pointing. May you be with the church and its leadership. May you be with each one of us individually as we continue to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you, church, um, you do your part and I'll continue to do mine. Amen.